and seven, and that was me. A uh, few pounds lighter. <laughs> but uh, I started for this slide because actually this was my last slide from 2007, and um, I will end up this talk with the same slide. And the reason for that is because during that process of working out the correlated environments in, quant in quantum error correction, um, I learned a couple, a couple of things. So, for example, at that time, I was wondering if you could have some quantum parameter and uh, have your computer protected against correlations. As you change this parameter, I found out, well, me and other people, right, that uh, your threshold derivation would still hold uh, if you satisfy some dimensional criteria. But then, when I look at this, it looks like very much a quantum phase transition phase diagram. So you have something that we call an upper critical dimension where perturbation theory works, where your expansion works. And below that, below the upper critical dimension, you kind of don't know. I didn't know. But I could guess, based on other, in the quantum phase transition schematic phase diagram, right, that uh, there could be uh, a region where the threshold could exist, but you need to sum up a lot of terms in order to see it. And another region where you could not compute at all, that correlations are so strong that will completely suppress your possibility to compute. Okay. So, um, now let me start. So what is the motivation? Well, we are all here because we would like to protect quantum information against the environment. So there are a lot of strategies like the coherent three subspaces, dynamical decoupling, topological systems, and quantum error correction, which is supposed to be very general. But from my perspective, uh, what I find interesting in quantum error correction is that in a correlated environment is that what you're doing is actually you're driving your system strongly and uh, creating with that a new state of matter, a possibility of having a different state. Right? You have this is a strong correlated problem when you have a correlated environment uh, with many, uh, of many body system, of a many body system. So as usual, right, I will start with the threshold theorem, which is the starting point of all these discussions. Right? Because it tells us that if you're below a certain noise strength, uh, we can process quantum information for arbitrary long times, right? And, um, and usually in QEC, the traditional assumptions, right, are fast measurements, but they are not really fundamental. Um, fast gates, and they are not fundamental again, in my opinion. And error models, which probably, in, in fact, what the error models add probabilities and not amplitudes. So. What happens if you start with a Hamiltonian? And if you start with a Hamiltonian and you still want to use those assumptions, you usually have to go and, and derive some Master equation and um, an, a notion of a local probability using a Markov, more Markov approximation. So, but as Daniel Lidar, Hobart Olicki, and Zanardi showed in 2006, Fast gates, constant supplies of fresh code and sealers, and the Markovian bath may not be mutually, cons mutually consistent. So we may have a problem. We may have to choose our poison and choose two all of, out of the streets hypothesis. Okay. So what happens in real systems also? Well, is that we most likely will have correlations in space and time. So you have your qubits evolving and they were excited some photons or some phonons, and they start talking with each other. Okay. So correlations in space and time are everywhere. And uh, we need to, to throw them out. We need to justify our assumptions. So, so are correlations really bad? So this is a back of the envelope calculation. It's actually a very simple calculation uh, to consider the pure phase in bath with an omic spectrum acting on a logical qubit. So you have a, just a single logical qubit. Here I draw five, a five qubit code. And I'm calculating here the lower bound for the trace distance between null evolving at all, right? The perfect evolution, right? It was a perfect memory. And this memory, this bath driving dynamics. And as you, uh, so the scales here are set up or you don't pay much attention to the numbers because the scales are set up to find this one here, so I turn at one. 
So you start here only with memory effects, which for the omic bath are very, very small, very low. Right? They grow slowly because they are logarithmic in time. But eventually, as the spatial correlations started to kick in, you see that your trace distance, this lower bound for your trace distance, start to increase very fast. So what, what can I tell about this graph is that, well, if you start believing that your local error probability is small and completely forget that you may have spatial correlations, sometimes you can, be the, you can go on, out of your threshold value because of the spatial correlations. So you need to be careful with your statements about measuring errors in one qubit and putting a bunch of them together. So a lot of people actually work on this problem, and these are some of them. Actually, these, those are the actually created, forged, the way that I think about the problem. Right? And especially Barbara Sterhall and Buckhart's paper was one of the special ones that I, I really enjoy to read and learn quite a lot. So, but what really created the whole framework that I'm going to talk about was a completely different paper from Richard Arnolf, right? Because in 2000, she wrote a paper where she was analyzing the threshold theorem as a quantum to classical transition. And she was saying that, well, if you are below a certain error probability, you are, you are in the threshold limit, you are, have resilient quantum computation and strong integrum of your computer. So this is like a low temperature regime, you are in a quantum regime. On the other hand, when you are above this threshold value, your computer is a noisy computer, actually is well simulated by a Turing machine. And this is a high temperature regime or a classical, a classical system. So, this quantum to classical transition actually motivated the way that I was thinking about this problem. Because, well, if I can imagine prior probabilities as a temperature, right, so this is low temperature and high temperature, can I add now a quantum axis here and think about what are correlations doing to this quantum axis, representing this quantum transition. So it certainly makes sense to think that there may be a quantum to quantum transition. Why? Well, because a quantum phase transition is defined by a, a qualitative change in the wave function of your ground state. Right? That's, that's how you, you pick up Sashdev's quantum phase transition book, and that's what it's written there. So you have a ground state wave function, and it changes as a function of a parameter of your Hamiltonian. So in QEC, we are not talking about a Hamiltonian, but we have a driven, we are forcing a particular state Right, that we want to have out, out, of, this, out of the problem, right, to preserve in, during the, the computer evolution. In this sense, we are defining a quantum phase. We are defining that state that we want to preserve. And so when you have a correlated environment, the question is, can your correlated environment drive you away from that particular state that you want? And so that's how I start to think about this problem in 2007. So the Gaussian model, the, the noise Gaussian model, actually is based, in the, is based on the generalization of the spin boson bath. Right? You have a free Hamiltonian for the bath, which is basic harmonic oscillators, and an interacting Hamiltonian between the degrees of freedom of the bath and your qubits. You also assume that there are some correlation functions be, uh, that obey a power. If it was an exponential decay, well, that wouldn't be a problem because then you can define formally the bohr markov approximation. So power laws are really the problem. And the Gaussian noise enters in the point that you need uh, to decompose, for practical purpose, the endpoint correlation functions into two points, products of two point correlation functions. So the, the important parameters here that I will show up later are D, the spatial dimension of your quantum computer, um, delta, as, uh, z is called the dynamical expon exponent, and delta is a scaling dimension of the interacting Hamiltonian. Okay, so how general is this model? Well, this can actually happen in many situations in physics, right? So you have electromagnetic fluctuations, phonons, charge fluctuations, and etc. But it does not cover everything. It does not cover a spin bath, for example. On the other hand, 
you can also think in a very general argument about this problem. You can think about uh, very, or qualitative or general, that after doing all possible hardware solutions to re reduce your decoherence, right? You do dynamical decoupling, dynamical um, decoherence free subspace, you do everything, you end up still with some residual decoherence between your computer, uh, the interaction between your computer and your environment. So you have this residual decoherence that it will happen. This environment is still very large by hypothesis, right? So it's very unlikely that the computer will have a strong influence in the environment, and the environment will be in a minimum of its local energy landscape. So now that you are, it's in this minimal energy of its landscape, you assume an harmonic approximation to this landscape and linear between the computer and the environment, and that's how you get to that model. So this is actually a paraphrasing of the original caldera laggett argument of how to derive this spin boson model. And so what I'm trying to say is that, well, eventually we will end up with something very similar to that. We may end up with something very similar to that after doing several layers of hardware protection to the system. So the basic assumption in 2007 was that, OK, I have a spin, but this, you know, a lattice of uh, a set of spins or qubits, but they are separated by a minimum distance. And, uh, and delta here is the time that takes me to do an error correction procedure, an error correction step. And so why they are separated by a minimum distance? Because I wanted them to have an identity to start with. I wanted to be able to define what I was calling the local error per qubit. So when I was doing, when, I, when, you, when you look at uh, the array of qubits and time evolving, I could separate it, the correlations into two parts. Correlations that would happen inside an error correction period, and this will address the probability of having errors, and correlations that will connect different error correction periods. And so by separating these two, I was creating, a, creating an expansion and defining an, a way to create an expansion of errors and correlations, right? So I would create, the, address the probability of having errors in certain positions in space and time, and I'll also add or compute uh, how corrections do to correlations between errors in different error correction, correction, time, er, error correction times would affect your result in the end. Step was to develop, the calculation was to develop a systematic expansion that would include these correlations and to study the stability of this expansion as a function of correlations. So the whole point was that, okay, I started with a well-defined system, which is the state that I wanted to protect, and now I'll start to add correlations and see how stable this per new perturbation theory is. So, it turns out that, well, it is stable inside this region, which I was calling loosely as above the upper critical dimension. So now we have a threshold theorem with, uh, for temperature, right, or for local error probabilities, which are well defined because the qubits are individual inside each one of, its, of those hypercubes of its boxes. And also now I have a quantum, a quantum axis to this graph. So, so sufficiently slow decaying, fast decaying correlation, sorry, um, the, the, the errors will not matter. The correlators, correlations will not matter. So, but what are these, these two phases? Do they really exist? So are they really there? And that was the question that I didn't know how to answer in 2007. What they mean, right? They do have, can I really address those situations? And how to consider the problem of a dense set of physical spins, right, without this hypercube hypothesis? Well, um, it turns out that I need to change the question. And the reason that I need to change the question is very obvious, right? Because when you are in one side of a phase transition, you're looking, you are starting with to, you're looking into a particular fixed point of, your, of the Hamiltonian space, right? it's very hard to see what's in the other side of the phase transition. You need to sum an infinite set of diagrams, an infinite family of, to actually calculate anything on the other side. 
So starting from the perspective of, of uh, fault-tolerance quantum computation, starting from that point would not tell me anything from the, for the other two sides, for the other two possible phases that I was guessing they may exist. So I changed the question now for something very different. So how, for how long can we compute using QEC? So do all the most favorable assumptions that you can do and ask yourself, for how long can you actually compute? So the friendly assumptions, still we see works. There are no errors in the measurements. Uh, state there are no errors in state preparation. There are no errors in gates. Quantum evolution with only known error syndromes will be taken into account. So what I'm saying is that, OK, I will never measure any error in the computer. The computer runs flawlessly uh, without any errors all the time. And what are the unfriendly assumptions? Well, I have a power lock correlation in time and space due to the BAF. So, so what the, what's left over, right? If I already assumed that I measure no errors, so what do I have? Well, when you do QEC, right, you encode a physical qubit in a larger Hilbert space. And you have your correctable errors and also the uncorrectable errors. So what I'm saying is that, well, I will look at these uncorrectable errors, and these are the things that are going to evolve my logical qubit. So that's pretty much everything that will happen, only the uncorrectable errors. Everything else will be suppressed, well, I will not take into account because I'm assuming that I'll have a perfect history of no errors at all. Okay, so every time that I measure a set of atoms, I measure no errors. So from all the possible evolutions of the quantum computer, I'm confining myself to consider this one. Why this one? Because from the experience from 2007, I know that this one is the one that leads you to the last possible decoherence. So this one will lead you to the longest computational time available for, to you. Right? All right, so the example that I will take into account is a five qubit code. Can I use any other code? Yes. But this one is the smallest one, right? For, and so it will make things easier. So you take the stabilizer codes and, the, and also the, the stabilizers for the code and also the logical words. And then you look up in this table here and you see that you have third order, certain third order events that are allowed. And of course, they have, there are certain events that are allowed because it's a, three dis, a distance three code, All right? So uh, these third order events here, which are products of the stabilizers and, and the logical words, are the ones that I'll keep. Why I'll keep them? Because they are the lowest order in the coupling between the computer and the environment. So again, it will give me an upper bound, so it's a very lower limit a very long time limit for what's possible to compute or not. And how the qubits are organized in space? Well, I assume spatial locality. So is, not, is this fundamental? No. But it's useful and it's also very physical. It's very physical because measurements and gates are hard to do. So you expect that your logical qubits will be very close together. Or the, the physical qubits that make out the logical qubits will be very close together. So I put them close together in a certain pattern, right? In a certain d-dimensional lattice. And now we look at the time evolution in the interaction picture. So we start with the usual Hamiltonian in the Dyson series, and you expand. And I expand just to first order. Why expanding the first uh, to first order? Because I'm assuming that for short times, for inside the QEC period, the likelihood of having very high order events is, is small. So what I'm doing is that I'm creating an expansion parameter, which is the coupling between the BAF and the computer times the QEC period. So I'm saying that this will be my new small parameter. And I will organize all the expansion from now on, from that point on. So I'm looking for a very large computer and very long times. I'm aiming to address this question. So, okay, 
you would just expand that, and you look back at your five qubit code, and you conf confine yourself to only the third order events, the ones that are allowed by the five qubit code. Right? So you're going to have, for example, two ZZ errors and an X error is allowed by the code. And here is your logical qubit operator. So inside of this logical qubit of measuring no error at all, I still have this quantum evolution to take on, to, to move on in time. Okay. So this evolution with no errors now can be reorganized into two parts. I have my three qubits, my three operators between the bath and the environment. And, um, and then you can break down in two parts. The first one, actually, it's a high order correlation event. It tells, it's going to show here, it tells me that, okay, I can have the three spins flipped, this one, this one, and this one, but they do not contract, they do not talk with anybody else in the same QVC period, but they'll talk with someone in a different, a different logical qubit or in a, at, a, at a different time. So when I do that, um, I can assume again spatial locality and realize that this is a um, smaller contribution to my sum, to my corrections. But on the other hand, I can have a contraction I think this guy died. Okay. It is working there. Thank you. Yeah, it's so I can have a contraction between two qubits inside a QVC period. So for example, two X errors that talk to each other. And then the Z error that doesn't talk to anybody. Well, we'll talk to someone later on in the computer evolution. Okay. So this two X errors, for example, that talk to each other create a randomized coupling constant. And so now I have these higher order correlations here and also a randomized coupling constant. And my sum, and my QEC period evolu evolution uh, was broken down into these two components. Okay, so now I'm going to pro out these higher order correlations using this spatial locality assumption for my, phys my physical and logical. And I will keep only this drast correlation, uh, that drast coupling constant. So what did I gain? Now I can re-exponentiate that, that operator and, and write an evolution operator for the logical qubits. So this is the evolution operator for the logical qubits that are time ordered. I have my effective coupling constant here, the coupling between the computer and environment that, was, that is coarse grain now, and the logical qubit. So this is the evolution for the logical qubits as time goes by, following this very particular history of syndromes. Well, I got a lot from QVC. First of all, my coupling constant now is way higher order, three, order three now in the coupling between the computer and the environment. And also, the ultraviolet cutoff was reduced. It's no longer the bare cutoff. It's related to the time that takes me to do a QEC calculation. So all these high ordered frequency moments of the bath, they kind of went away. So, but what it bothers me with this expression, and what's the problem with that, is now I recreated exactly the same functional form that I had when I started. So now I have an expression for the evolution of the logical qubit that's related to the bath exactly in the same form as the original physical qubits were talking to the bath. So now how I'm going to compute this upper bound for the time available to, com to, to do quantum computation? I will once again look at the trace distance. I will look at the trace distance between these evolution of logical qubits due to this interaction environment is, and this ideal density matrix when there's absolutely no evolution at all. 
So this tells me how hard it will be to distinguish the two by measurements. So the information loss by the single qubit, a single logical qubit, it's very simple to calculate because it became now a problem of a single spin. I don't have to worry about my five spins anymore evolving in time. I reduce everything to a single spin, and I can, and I can look it up into the books. And I just look up, and this is the expression. And these are the kinds of, of, of functions that you need to calculate. So, so you need to calculate the expectation value of sigma z and the expectation value of sigma plus, logical sigma plus. So this, the coherence function, you can go to many books, Vaz books, for example, and look it up. And this is the integral or function that you need to do. You just need to do this integral in momentum space to find out what happens. And this is the result. The result is that the trace distance now, depending on certain parameters of the environment, has four different possible evolutions. The so for, for, for zeta, this function here, smaller than zero, actually it's independent of time. Where what is zeta? So is two times z is the dynamical exponent of your theory. So it's how time and space are, are related. <coughs> S is related to that dynamical um, yeah, the, the, the scaling exponent that I talked in the beginning. And D is the number of spatial dimensions of the bath. So if this is smaller than zero, then it's absolutely no, there's absolutely no dependence. There is this initial small decay of the trace distance, but after that, it doesn't go away anymore. It stays there. If zeta is exactly zero, then you have a log growth in what the number of QEC steps that you're doing. So the trace distance starts, grow, starts to grow very slowly, logarithmic with the number of QEC steps. For zeta between zero and two, now it actually uh, grows as a power law. And from zeta larger than two, it formally diverges. Right? Because it will depend on the size of the bath. So for a very large bath, actually, it will grow, the trace distance will go to, to one very fast. So the result now, if you invert, so just what I said, if you invert that expression for time, you know, so this is the number of QEC steps, and you assume that there is a maximum trace distance that you can tolerate between the ideal evolution and the uh, evolution that you have due to this residual inter interaction between the computer and the bath, you found out that for this subomic case, right, you have this initial decay of the, of the trace distance, and, um, and eventually, oh, <laughs> doesn't work. Thank you. Initial decay. Oh, man. <laughs> you don't want me to finish this. Oh, there you go. So you have this initial decay, but after that, it doesn't decay anymore. And so if you start below the threshold, you're going to stay there forever. So for, on the other hand, for zeta equals to 0, you grow, but uh, you grow not, it, the, the growth is not that bad. So pictorially, right? oh, I'm going to talk later. So now what about an array of qubits? So to calculate it, the trace distance for a, an array of qubits, and now I, I don't have, I'm not, I'm, I, ha, I have a, it's really a spin array that is coupling to this bosonic path, and it kind of mimics a lot of what you do in solid state. So it, but even to do that without having to worry about the QEC evolution and measurement and so on and so forth, this, everything was taken into account already, uh, this is a hard problem. So I cannot do this for the trace distance. But I can do something for the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. And I can bound the trace distance with the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Right? So n is the number of logical qubits, and this is the relation between the two norms. So the Hilbert-Schmidt norm can be written now in this form. 
And again, these are the all the elements inside that, that matrix that you need to calculate. And you came again facing another integral in momentum space that you can do. So now I'm just going to need to calculate all these integrals here. And the result that you find is very similar to what you had before. But now you have the self-interacting part of the diagonal terms of the density matrix to look at. And this define what I'm a particular zeta. And you have the correlated parts, the off-diagonal terms of that density matrix to look at. And this define another zeta. So here, what enters, what the difference between the two for, color, for the correlations part, part, you also have a term that will depend on the dimension of your computer. So if you will lay down the, the, the spins in a square lattice or in a cubic lattice, this will change this criteria here. Now, so when you go back and then you see that you once again have four possible behaviors. A subomic, where you have something that is independent of, this, in the, of the number of QC steps that you're doing. And the other three, which actually will depend on the number of QC steps that you're doing. So for how long you can compute? Well, you can invert this, those expressions and find out, well, if you start below the, the threshold for, the subomic bath, for a superomic bath, you can compute for an infinite amount of time, assuming all these good hypotheses that I did. If you are the omic case, then it grows, but it doesn't grow that bad. So this is the critical distance that you assume that you can have to compute. And in the other cases, you start to grow very, go away really fast. So graphically, that's what, that's the pictorial thing that you have. So for a superomic bath, you can go below, and you, if you start below the, the, trace, the threshold, at what you call a threshold distance, you go and you stay <coughs> below this threshold. You have initial decay, and after that, you don't decay anymore. And, um, on the other hand, for the omic bath, you eventually grow very slowly and eventually crosses your threshold distance, but very slowly. And finally, for the subomic and uh, the adversary scenario, you, you go really fast away from, from this ideal evolution. So now, what this tells me? Well, this tells me is that there are, first of all, there are adversary environments to QEC. So if you have correlated environments, Depending on the interplay of the dimensions of the bath and the dimensions of the computer and, this, and the parameters that enter into it, you can have some environments that are really bad, that correlations actually will drive you away from your desired quantum state. In, situations where there's, uh, in, in certain situations, it is possible to improve a lot by doing engineering on your, on your qubit. You don't need to put them all together. You can put them apart. You can try to uh, reduce all these effects. And so it is not a, an absolute statement uh, that I'm saying that it is impossible to compute for certain environments. It just means that you need to rethink your engineering when you find certain situations. In all cases, the total logical qubits enter in this in, this, uh, in the expression for the total amount of time available. But this is expected. So this is not something that you wouldn't expect. Even in a stochastic error model, that's what you expect. And the three regimes that I just described, they really qualitative, enter in this qualitative interpretation of resiliency as a dynamical quantum phase transition. So what I'm saying is that, OK, so when you are in this superomic regime, you are in this traditional threshold theorem limit, in a place that perturbation theory works fine, and uh, you can expand in terms of the correlations and correct for the existence of correlations systematically. When you're in this finite, the, the omic case, or the upper critical dimension, is when you start to grow very slowly away from the regime, where you need to sum up an infinite family of logs in order to find a qualitative result, a quantitative result. On the other hand, 
in this subomic regime, you have a finite amount of time available to you to do the computation. And the reason for that is because all these leftovers, all these trace, this, the, this uh, uncorrectable errors will start to accumulate and will drive you away from your ideal state in a fashion that is faster than logarithmic with the number of QC steps. Finally, if you're below this lower critical dimension, below this so bad condition for zeta smaller, uh, larger than zero, uh, it's not possible to compute formally. And why is that? Because all the expressions, uh, the, the, they are suppressed by the size of the bath. As the size of the bath gets bigger, that you have available to compute becomes smaller. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Well, you started the same uh, slide and ended the same slide as the previous time, and I actually have the same question as I had the previous <laughs> time. There is a design of qubits that would allow you to couple the, to the bath, not as a dipole coupling, but as a quadrupole coupling, as an octopole coupling, etc., and that would reduce the delta a lot. And so in ion quantum computer, you would just use dark transition in spin qubits, you just use spin up, spin down encoding, double quantum spins or triple quantum spins, and those would reduce them dramatically. Yes. And so the delta would go up, and so, you know, not possible to compute, that means unless you do some tricks which experimentalists are sort of very good at. Yeah, I agree. So, but that's why I was trying to say when you started the discussion, when I started the discussion, right, is that, well, how generic this is. The generic, what I'm trying to, to, ex to, to, to explain, or I better say to, um, uh, to argue, is that the, this bath, this omic bath, or this uh, bosonic bath, is very ubiquitous, right? After you do everything that you think about, the coherence-free subspaces, right, uh, or um, dynamical decoupling, there will still be some leftovers. And it's very likely that we'll be able to model these leftover interactions by a bosonic bath. And so I'm not saying that these bosons here that I'm discussing are necessarily electromagnetic fluctuations or the phonon fluctuations, but everything that is left over after you go to a logical or to a, 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 a first layer of hardware protection. So uh, you did this analysis for the five-bit code, but do you have any sense of where these, how these, thread, these, those two crossover points depend on the properties of the code? So the co what the code will do to you is actually increase or reduce, increase the power of protection due to this distance, right? So when you increase the distance of the code, that effective coupling constant will become higher power in the bare coupling constant. So the, in terms of the general analysis, nothing changes much, but, uh, but the effective coupling constant will be extremely reduced by a larger distance code. That's why surface code seems to good, right? Because the surface code will grow, the, the distance of the code will grow, right, as, the, as, you, as you grow the lattice. But on the other hand, the qubits are very close together, so there will be a lot of correlations there too. I would just like to ask for clarification. Could you please go back to the slides where sure. you where you where you show the curves as your quantum in showing how your quantum information degrades over time? Yes. <coughs> so there was the super omic case that seemed to be too good to be true. So you are not losing all quantum information in the limit of infinite time. That's right. And let me just clarify <coughs> that. It's because I'm also I'm assuming that I have an infinite computer and I have an infinite amount of time that I'm computing, but also an infinite computer. So what I'm just saying is that the and I'm assuming all these very very good evolutions, these evolutions with higher high order in the bear coupling. So they are so they are, so they are very dilute. So when you take the thermodynamical limit, these errors, these leftover errors, 
they are very dilute in space, and so when you calculate the trace distance, they will not take you away. Okay, I'm just asking because even if you would use one of our phenomenological error models, <laughs> totally independent in time, I mean, for such an error model, sooner or later, you would lose your quantum information yeah. in, in the limit of infinite time. Uh, you would lose everything. So you would, e yeah, so you would end up with a completely depolarized density matrix. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about those other curves and about the slopes. Mm -hmm. So for those other three regimes, and you may have said it, what do the slopes depend upon? Do they depend on how many encoded qubits you have uh, in your computer? What do they depend upon? So the slopes here, they are actually most, they are just a figure, they are just, they were just draw. They are not really calculated, right? So because this is a quantitative statement. But uh, if you go back and, uh, and see what they really depend in terms of the code, as I said, is the distance of the code. The larger is the distance of the code, so the smaller, the, so the longer time it will take you to cross your threshold. So that's it. So the larger the distance, the longer time you'll take you to do that. So that's pretty much what I have to say. Right? Uh, about the superomic case, is very much super, is, as I think we discussed this before, is very much like uh, when you calculate the, the gecko and so on and so forth. You, if you have these superomics, you can do the numerics, and you just oscillate it. You have an initial drop of the fidelity, for example, and then you oscillate it back and forth, back and forth. Any further questions? Well, we'll hear about that last point a little later today in one of the uh, afternoon talks. But uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Sam.